So, uh, first of all, I, I would like to emphasize some things. Uh, I tried to make this presentation like in several parts, but I think the, let's say, red line of this presentation is that uh, now ongoing uh, European crisis is sort of designed through some layers of not only ideologies, but also some techniques of uh, rules of the ruling elites. So, uh, I will try to emphasize this through economic landscape, which is called economic engineering. Uh, I basically uh, do done that on purpose uh, using the word engineering. Uh, why? Uh, first of all, I would try to say that uh, in also in the perspective of this crisis, uh, that also in the beginning of the 90s, there was a big, big fuss in the let's say, landscape of, of the European Union and European Commission and so on about the tax uh, decoordination. Uh, why, am I talking, why am I talking about the tax system? Because it's embedded or is it incorporated also in this European crisis. Uh, and for example, there is one quotation which is really interesting from the European Commission. European Commission has admitted in 1996 or so, basically 15 years ago, that uh, this tax competition is not so good for the states. Uh, this was taken for the so-called Verona report. But what happened afterwards, uh, in the same document, for example, it says something uh, similar that the overall national nominal tax rate is the most relevant driver, and so on and so on, about competitiveness. But after 1996, it has totally changed its mind. So, in 96, during the 90s, it, there was also talking or talks about that there should be like a harmonized lowest tax income, corporate, uh, co corporate tax income. But after that, European Commission didn't mention that. And after that, tax competition has begun to accelerate. So that's why I'm saying this consequently. This is happening. So if you look behind me, this trend is really, really strong. So the corporate income tax, so the tax which is paid by the uh, companies uh, for the profits is basically throughout these years is lowering. So it's going really low from basically about 35% in 95, 96 to basically 24 or even less, 23%. So why is this so important? Because the European Commission and also the national states and the politicians, they are saying we have to lower this corporate income tax to get the foreign investment to get investment, to get foreigners to come to here, to get the money, basically. Uh, and I give you, for example, the latest issue from Slovenia. On the one hand, the Slovenian government is saying we need to cut the budget because, you know, it's austerity time, we need to cut the social welfare state and so on. On the other hand, it's saying we have to also cut the corporate income tax. But the same government has said that the budget will be in the budget there will be about 200 million euros lost because of lowering the corporate income tax. So the same government is saying that we have to cut social welfare, but on the other hand we have 200 million euros to give to the virtual or fictitious uh, uh, investment or investors just to, give, to say to them we are a good investment country. So this is like a big fight right now, which is also going on in Slovenia, but the trend is like this. So the, the corporations, or let's say like also the countries are saying, if we lower the taxes, then the investment will come. 
And this is like a really big uh, chart. I won't say most, much more about it. But I will give you an example, Ireland. Ireland has had a corporate income tax uh, in the amount of 40% at the beginning of the, uh, in 1995. In 2011, it had the income tax of 12%. So it has fallen for 27%. And if you look at the numbers of the unemployed people, so the, the state is saying, if you lower the tax, then the unemployment will go down. Not sure. In Ireland, as we all know, it went up. Not only you know, this last year, but not only this previous year. But in the same period, when this happened, for example, from 2000 to 2011, the unemployment went from 4% to 14%. Despite the fact that, the, for example, corporate income tax went down sky high, really for 27%. So there is a really, really a big problem regarding the, let's say, uh, how the politicians, national politicians, are defining uh, how to bring uh, foreign investments into the country with lowering the taxes, and which is consequently abused as an argument to cut the social welfare, to cut the social state. Because, you know, if you don't have uh, any more revenues, then you just say, okay, because we don't have any more revenues, then we have to cut also the budget. And this is right now also going on in Slovenia, but not only in Slovenia, I, as you can see, throughout the whole European Union. Uh, the concrete cases, not only did the income tax for the, corp for the companies went down really, really strongly, but in some cases, for example, as in Poland, it went down to zero. So in Poland, for example, they have special economic zones in which there is no corporate income tax, zero. There is, there is uh, of course, a possibility to pay a little bit more, like 30% of this corporate income tax, but there are 14 free economic zones in which companies, corporations, so on and so forth, they don't pay these taxes. And this is not only the case of Poland, this is for example also the case of Serbia. I was, let's say, uh, looking at all the numbers and this behind me, this charter, these blue lines, this is taken from the official site of the Serbian Agency for Foreign Investment. And one of the arguments why you should come to Serbia is because in Serbia there is 10% corporate income tax. But uh, I will give you an even more concrete example. I was, I don't know, four or five months in Serbia in uh, Stara Pazova, and there is a place or the factory of Gurenje, the Slovenian company Gurenje. And in Stara Pazova they were subsidizing uh, each employment of Gurenje the, to come to Serbia in the amount of 4,000 euros. So, for each worker, the Serbian government hand away or give 4,000 euros to Gurenje to come to Serbia. And on the other hand, when I was, work, when I was talking to the workers, uh, their salary is 150 euros. So, in one sense, you could say where I'm going. So, on one hand, the country is saying, we will give almost everything just to come, but when you're saying about the workers, well, this is another story, don't bother with that. And really, don't bother with that, because uh, in this same factory, in 2009, uh, six workers tried to organize a trade union, and for the reward like this, they were handed like a really threat from the employer that if you do that, we don't need you anymore. So, basically, we have a two, two-fold story. A story of success of the investment and a story of the workers which were, which were paying for that invest, investment. Sorry. And this is not only the story of this uh, Slara Pazova, for example. And the story goes on. Uh, another uh, place, Zaječar, in Serbia, said, we will give you 10,000 euros if you come to us for each worker. So now Gorenje said, okay, we will come there. And what happened? It happened like a conflict between these two small cities because, you know, you know they were like illegal competition. But <laughs> illegal competition in this sense is really like an awkward situation. But to cut this story shorter, as you can see, the states are basically trying to act like companies, being as competitive as much 
as they, as they can, but on the price of the social state, because there is no, no more revenues to come from the taxes to pay also to all the public uh, schools and also to public health and so on. This is only one case. If you go, for example, to Romania, to Slovakia and so on, this is also the same case. You know what happened, for example, to Nokia plant in Germany? Nokia plant went from Bochum in Germany directly to Romania, to Kuju, the, the plant, because you know also about the preferential tax treatment, and then it went from Romania to South Asia. So you, there is a never-ending story about the tax competition within the states. And if the state goes this way, we have a big problem. On the other hand, if the tax is on the corporate income tax is going down, who is paying? But also the consumers, because the VAT, so the value added tax, is going up. On the other hand, because you know the state has to, like uh, you know, of course, pay all all the necessary uh, means to, let's say, as I was saying, finance all the structures which it, which it has. And this is a quotation, for example, within the ILO. Uh, in the World of Work 2011 report. And there were like two shifts, as I was saying. First, there has been a spike in the contribution of goods, so uh, in the taxes of the government revenue, and there has been an important decrease of the tax income. So we are now facing, and I, I'm basically concluding with this first part, we are facing of transfers with, of, let's say, public responsibility between the companies and the state. So the companies, they want to have lower, lower, lower taxes and the state is basically transferring this subsidy in the form of corporate income tax to the consumers, to the workers. And not also that, as you can see behind me, I will quote that because the data is really strong. This is according to the official data, European Commission and so on. So also the wage share in the GDP has fallen. So from 17%, for example, to 66%. So the first part, as you can see, there is a big transfer of responsibility. So, uh, and this, because of that, the social state is really on the verge of attack. The second engineering is labor market engineering, which is not going on right now. On, uh, it's also going on right now, but it started in 1990s, let's say, the, uh, also in the 80s and so on. And I will give you one quite interesting case study from Germany. You know, everybody's talking about the, now the German miracle. Everybody's talking that uh, they are the only one economically really strong right now. But on the, on the expense of what? The quotation from Gerhard Schroeder, Germany had established the best low pay sector in Europe. So this is quotation for Gerhard Schroeder. And the same Gerhard Schroeder is now uh, writing an article which was published in one of the Slovenian uh, news, uh, news companies also. And it says, uh, he's saying that we need a growth pact and so on and so forth. The same guy was basically saying that we need to establish the low pay sector in Europe. And really it was a success story in regards to that sentence. And the other irony way is that a colleague was saying about the, uh, how is it good to connect the red and the green alliance in a sense of ecology. Well, in here, we have a red-green federal government which was enacting this liberalization and deregulation of labor markets. So I'm saying, you know, this social democrats and the, the, the green, they were the ones who were imposing deregulation of labor market. They were the ones who were imposing liberalization of social welfare state, or so to say so, they were the ones who were imposing also that the recipients of welfare, welfare recipients, should be more disciplined in a way of, you know, if you don't uh, take any job, we will give you, we will don't, we will, we won't give you anything. So this happened throughout the 2000s. This started in a so-called hard law. And uh, why it says, no, this is like a funny story, why is it uh, uh, like Hart's law? Well, it's named by Peter Hartz, and he was the guy who was HR manager of the Volkswagen. And he was responsible for all the, uh, he, was, he was the head of the group uh, which were heading, which were like, uh, let's say, implementing this agenda 2010 reform. 
So he was a businessman. And the, this reform really, really was managed good in a sense which you will see in the next uh, slide. And uh, for example, I will say only this. The precariousness has really, really risen. The social exclusion in some way is really, really on the rise in Germany, but nobody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about uh, that, for example, in the last data, only 5% unemployment in Germany. So the third, the third lowest uh, unemployment rate in Germany. But nobody is saying about that story behind me. It's, you know, I know it's quite small, so I will try to emphasize it a bit more. First of all, part-time employment in Germany. It went really sky high. It went from the ratio from 14% of the uh, employment of the working age to 26%. So this is really a really big, big gap. Why it happened? Because of the so-called mini jobs. Uh, mini jobs is a, so, is, a sport, is a part of, let's say, margin, marginal part employment, and you are allow, uh, people were like allowed to work, for example, 15 hours a month and so on. But in 2003, all the obstacles in hours were cut. And after that, we have about 6 million mini jobbers in Germany. And the poverty rate, or let's say working poor rate among them, is more than 80%. So this is one story. The other story is fixed term contract. It went also from 7.5% uh, to 10%. Or to be more concrete, it went to 3.5 million persons working on a fixed term contracts. And the third story, for example, is the story of temporary agency workers. It went, for example, from 100 euros to now to a million. So basically now we have about a little bit less than a million temporary agency workers in Germany. And this is all part of the story of Agenda 2010. So, liberalize, on one hand, the labor market, on the other hand, regularize the welfare recipients, because, you know, they are lazy, they don't want to work, and you get this type of labor market. People are afraid, people, they have to take up any job, any precarious job, and, for example, not only job, people have to become also some self-employed. So they are not workers anymore, they are a service. And this is also another really big issue which is going on right now in the European Union, because this uh, scenario of transferring the workers to services is not only the German story, it's also the English story, it's also a Spanish story, it's also Italian story. But what happens when you transfer a worker to the service? There is no obligation anymore from the employer, because you don't have an employer anymore. You have a self-employed person, and you have somebody who is ordering their service. You have, for example, I will give you a concrete example in Ljubljana. You have a company, a taxi, tax, ta taxi company. You have basically 200 taxis and 200 self-employed persons. And each taxi is a company. So this is quite an extremely big problem, because also the ILO is saying, who is then responsible for who? I had a concrete case when a worker came to me and asked me for help because an employer wouldn't give him a salary for six months. And uh, he was saying that uh, an employer has said to him, he has to go to the employment service in Slovenia to get a subsidy to be self-employed, then he will come back to me. He went to this employment service, he got a subsidy, then he got back to this employer. He didn't get nothing in six months. And then I said to him, we'll go directly to the Inspectorate of Labor. You know what, you know what happened? Inspector, in, the, the same Inspector of Labor has said, you're not my responsibility, because you're not part of labor law. You're part, you're part of obligatory law of the other parts, which, was coming, which are coming back to the employment, con to the uh, service contracts. So you're basically not covered by any labor law. You don't have rights because you're self-employed. And it was written in a statement by the labor inspector. I was just astonished. This is like a small story, but uh, with a big impact for the worker. Sorry, service. <laughs> and uh, in this sense, also one million self-employed persons have emerged in the last couple of years in Germany. One million. And 
I will, talk, I will like to emphasize this uh, because uh, what are the politicians saying? What is not only politicians? What are the economical, like you know, masterminds saying? That there is not a problem with the flexibilization, with the labor market, uh, which is flexibilized. It's a problem when it's not sufficiently flexibilized. For example, I will give a quotation from a former IMF, IMF chief economist. They were, they were asking him, why do you think the Argentina experiment didn't succeed? Yeah, because there were no, not so much flexibilization as we have anticipated. The labor market wasn't so flexible as it should be. So we need, if we would have more flexible labor market, then in Argentina, there wouldn't be so much crisis. And also, for example, the deputy manager and director of the IMF said the same thing. If in Argentina we would have more flexible markets, more flexible labor market, for example, then the crisis would be lower. And the, the other, on the other hand, right now, in the European Union, unfortunately, as a trade unionist, I have to say that we are in the midst of deregulation, massive deregulation of labor laws. Not only in one state, not only in one perspective, but according to the latest uh, ETUC, this is European Trade Union Confederation report, throughout the whole to the European Union, uh, we, we are facing, for example, the uh, labor laws changes, which are going directly in a way of breaching the, let's say, protection of the workers. Either in a sense, for example, in Czech Republic, or also in Greece and Spain, uh, there is, for example, uh, in legislation, a, a limit to, on how much times can you prolong your fixed term contract. Not anymore. In some cases, uh, they were like two years, now it's three years, now it's four years, for example, and so on. Over time, you have a labor law legislation, for example, of course, a limit. How much overtime can you work? Now it's on the rise, also in Greece and Spain and so on. You have also obligations on the layoffs and the redundancies. How much time before the redundancy is the employer obliged to say to the worker that we don't have any, any more job to you? Also, this is cut. Also, collective agreements, which is really strong, <laughs> logically, a weapon of the trade unions, they are totally breached. In Spain and in Greece, the state has went so far that the trade unions for Spain and Greece have filed a legal suit against the state on the court of the International Labour Organization. But don't bother, let's say, the Troika. Well, well, it's a necessity, we have to do that. All this is, uh, is going on right now. Also in Slovenia, I was just reading the article today, uh, our labour minister is saying our labour market is too rigid. We have to flexibilize our labor market to, well, I didn't say that, but he said that we have to provide a means to, uh, for new investment. So basically he's saying that if we liberalize the labor market, the new investment will come, the new, labor, the new jobs will arise from that and so on. But this is really a catastrophic uh, event for the workers. Because on the one hand, they don't get any jobs because now we are in the midst of the crisis. On the other hand, the labor market legislation is deregulized. So they're not, they are not anymore protected as they should be. So they're kicked out of their jobs. They don't have any more prospect of getting a new job. And work, the workers who are on the labor market, they're so afraid that they are, they are sticking to their jobs uh, as much as possible. I will tell you a tragic, a tragic story. Well, it is a tragic story. As a trade unionist, we are I'm faced with uh, more and more cases when a worker comes to me and says, I didn't get any wage for four or five months. And I'm saying to him, OK, this is total breach of law. Let's file a sue or legal action against that employer. After a day or two, this worker disappears. He doesn't want to talk to the trade union or anybody anymore. He's so much afraid. After several days, maybe he comes back and says, no, 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 I don't want to do anything. And I'm saying, if you don't want to do anything, I, I can't do anything in the name of you. And there are more and more this type of workers. This is like, you know, self-stigmatization, which is now going on. The more you liberalize the labor market, 
the more afraid and disciplined workers you get, and the more afraid and disciplined the workers you get, this is another spiral which is going on right now, the more you can press on them. Right now, we are facing a situation in which the employers, they're thinking, why should I pay to the worker? If, for example, my colleague, which is also an employer, doesn't pay. If, for example, as the case in Slovenia, we have for the whole labor market, 46 labor inspectors, and there are about 180,000 employers. Why should I then bother with paying social contributions, for example? And right now, this is being almost legalized by the way of liberalizing the labor market protection. And this is like a really horrific story. And uh, another story which is now going on is the connection between the financial markets and the labor markets. The financial markets are extremely quick in transactions. And they want that also the labor markets should be as quick as quick. And the story is, as the charter behind me is saying, the more market capitalization that you have, so the more money goes through the, uh, this fictation uh, shares, uh, the less labor protection you have as a worker. Because the financial market wants a flexible labor market and the flexible employer wants, of course, flexible employee, flexible worker. And this EPL is like an OECD term for employment protection legislation. And it's going down and down and down. The another story is like this, uh, this one behind me is on the, on the downside. How much time does a tr financial trans transaction need to be a financial transaction, at, for example, at the NASDAQ market? 0 0.03 seconds. That's how much time, for example, a financial transaction takes between two persons or two companies or let's say uh, to x to the y. 0 0.03 seconds. So that's why I'm asking rhetorical questions. How could a person can be so much flexible? <laughs> that's why we are facing right now this story. The more the financial markets, let's say, abuses the power also in a political landscape, the more we will pressure on the labor market in a sense of labor protection. And this is another story which is quite sad. And the more the financial markets become strong, the more important the shareholders will become. Not the workers, but the shareholders. What do they want? They want profit. And in one story behind that, or the two stories behind that, is, for example, when do the companies do the layoffs or the, the redundancies? When they don't need any more workers? In January? and in June. Why? Because in January they confirm the balance sheets and in June they revise the balance sheets. So they want to uh, show to their share shareholders that their profits are bigger on the expense of laying off the workers, despite the fact that they have a lot of profits. I will give you an example from the Unilever, which is a big, big company. And what happened in 2007, uh, their the CEO, Patrick Chesau, uh, I think, was saying that uh, we have a lot of profit, but we would have even more if we, if we would lay off 20,000 workers. So, 20,000 workers were lay off in the name of profit margins for shareholders. Not because the, uh, the industry said we don't have any more jobs for them, but only that the dividends would become higher. That's why this is a big, big problem this in the face of the financial markets. Uh, the other story is social engineering. I was telling a bit about that before that uh, in the German story, because you know, uh, in the more and more there is a stereotype of lazy recipient of the you know social welfare, which is go, which is uh, sleeping at home doing nothing and so on and so forth. But this is not only the, this is not only stereotype. First of all, uh, the more and more we are faced with the principle of activation within the social welfare state. So you have to activate yourself regardless of what, regardless the, let's say, wage you will be having. And in eight countries of the OECD, we have a so-called sub-minimum wage. So in order for young people to be employed, they have to have a sub-minimum wage, the wage which is 
below the poverty, uh, poverty rate. Employers are saying we will employ them only on that mean if we will have like subminimum wage. And it, it's happening right now. It's happening in Greece, it's happening in Netherlands and so on. And I was talking to the representative of Ministry of Labor last week. Uh, it was like a big conference in Denmark about youth employment. And I was saying, to, uh, I was asking him publicly, how can you imagine, what do you think, what does the young person think of himself when on the only means that the employer would uh, employ him is sub-minimum wage? And he replied quite quickly and promptly and really shockingly, well, this is quite an effective way to employ young people. This is the only way to employ, this is like a quotation, he said that this is the only way to employ young people. Not, this, not on the fact that they are highly educated, as Kostas was saying. No, because they are low cost. And because, and he said also that, because they are lazy. They don't want to take any jobs. That's why we had to enact sub-minimum wage for them. So we had to activate them. The other, the other way if, is demonization of the recipients and also the immigrants. We had a big case of changing the social welfare uh, laws last year in Slovenia and I was counting how much times did the word abuse came out in this process. In only one document, 58 times, all the parliamentary members, despite the left or the right scale, they were talking about of abuses of the social welfare recipients. They were, they were talking about that the money is not going there, that they are abusing the money and so on. The another story which is quite, <laughs> I don't know if I would say funny because it's really misleading. I will just quote this. In, it happened in Denmark. Uh, party leader from the Democrat, Democratic Party, Pia Keskegaard, proposed banning satellite dishes in 2010 so people wouldn't be able to uh, look at Al Jazeera and so on. This, is, this, is a this was an official proposal from one of the biggest political parties in Denmark two, two years ago. And it's quite astonishing when you look at the history. In 61, what happened? In 61, there was like a group which was called uh, Freie Deutsche Jugend. It was like a group of young people which, was going, which were going on the rooftops of the West Germany apartments and they were diverging the satellite dishes, not the satellite dishes, but the antennas, sorry, the antennas towards the West Germany. So they were doing the, the basically the totalitarian system of the thinking is the same. And it's happened in the 60s and now it's the same thinking. So we don't need, let's say, foreign or different thinking. We don't need immigrants because they are ripping off our social state. And that's why I'm coming to the next way. It's like the made in welfare state, you know, like made in Germany, made in Japan, the made in welfare state. And this is quotation from the famous Tilo Sarazin, you know, we everybody know him, the former member of the, uh, the board of Deutsche Bundesbank. And he was saying, integration requires effort from those that are to be integrated. I will not show respect for anyone that is not making that effort. I do not have to acknowledge anyone who lives by welfare, denies the legitimacy of the very state that provides them that welfare. That holds for the 70% of the Turkish and 90% of the Arab population in Berlin. They are lazy, they are just home. And unfortunately, people were quietly agreeing with that sentences. People, it was like a big sell. It, the books were selling like crazy of this guy, like Tila Sarazi. And also on the left side, there were people who were agreeing on that. So this is like social engineering. So blame and shame game. It's not the corporate income tax that is to blame that if we don't have any more money for the social state. The immigrants are the blame. The lazy recipients of the social states are the blame. And on the end, political engineering. How do you transform this ideology into concrete action? Into concrete political program, which goes also through legislation process. I will give you two examples, which are quite fascinating in quotation. Uh, last year I was in Athens uh, at one of the really interesting meetings and one of my colleagues hand me over the document which is called Political Feasibility of Adjustment. It's basically a program, step-by-step -step guide, how do you implement fiscal uh, adjustment in any state? How do you implement 
in a way that you disqualify your opponents, not only trade unions. Uh, there was also a project from the OECD, how to gain political support from, for reforms. This, this is like really step-by-step -step guide, how do you disqualify all the people which don't agree that the fiscal uh, let's say, uh, component, which is not right now out, is not the right way. How do you disqualify all the people which are saying that the austerity measures are not all right? And the left side document, the political feasibility adjustment, it's from 1996. It's not from yesterday, it's not from a year before, it's, not, it's 15 years old. And the scenario over there, it's based on the previous also conditions. So I will just briefly say what are the scenarios, what are, let's say, the basic focal points of this step-by-step uh, -step guide, how to implement deregulation, financialization, fiscal adjustment, and so on. First of all, timing. So, the OECD is saying this. If a government comes to power at a time when macroeconomic imbalances are developing, it enjoys, it enjoys a short honeymoon period, three to four months, when it can implement their strategy of solving with this fiscal discipline. So it has a three or four months period in which it can be, let's say, this strategy it can be implemented. And if, doesn't, if this, this doesn't work, it can also say the previous government was to blame. So in this, let's say, narrow period, it has time to change everything. So this is one thing which was, you know, let's say, emphasized by the OECD. You have only this time of period. The another one, coalition building. You have to build a very strong coalition uh, in, a, in order, let's say, to be leveled with the opposition. I will give you an example from Slovenia when, they were, when the government was talking about the fiscal adjustment and so on. What was the first action for the government? It went to the employers, it went to the business, businessmen. Every day there was like in the media coverage. This businessman was saying this. This chamber of commerce was saying that. We need to cut uh, social welfare, we need to cut the social state and so on. It's a necessity, uh, uh, it's like, uh, it's not a bargain, we have to do that. Why we have to do that? Because, you know, the financial market, we ha it has to say that we are like uh, a state in which we can trust. And this is like a concrete, yeah, every sentence which is here written is being materialized to the political strategies, not only in Slovenia, but also in other states. In the crisis, in the period of crisis, it will be necessary to introduce measures which are more strict, okay, and uh, more dangerous politically. This is quite a big problem. How, for example, to the politicians, how do you do that? Uh, and uh, this is, uh, let's say, uh, in a sense, quite a big problem for them because they have to combine which uh, are not only arguments, but actions should be taken first. So I will give an example throughout the Europe. What are they doing? They are cutting from the public sphere. Why they are cutting from the public sphere? Because they know there is a big conflict artificially made between the public sphere workers and the private sphere workers. You know, I'm saying that deliberately artificial because there is no, there shouldn't be any conflict, but unfortunately there is a big conflict, not only in one state but several states. And part two is about which measures, measures are dangerous or which measures are less dangerous. Well, dangerous measures are the ones who are producing not only strikes, because the strikes, they last for day two. We can survive that, don't we, as the politicians? But when the strikes become demonstrations, well, there is a big problem, because demonstrations have a big mobilization uh, power. After that, the reduction of wages and employment in the administration. Sorry, uh, sorry, and parapublic enterprises. Uh, this is quite a dangerous uh, measure because, you know, in this uh, parapublic uh, companies and administration, the trade unions are well organized, so we have to face uh, quite a big obstacle. But nevertheless, let's try it, they say. Uh, less dangerous measures are, for example, cuts in public investment, cuts also, unfortunately, in operating expenditure of the schooling system and so on. 
So there is a scale which is publicly made of which measures are to be enacted first, second, third, to be efficiently enough. And of course, in the sense of political propaganda, you have to use the fear factory effect. So when you are talking about the measures that it has to be implemented, you have to really frighten the opponent, you have to really frighten the worker that we don't have any, any more, uh, let's say, alternative just to do that. On the other hand, uh, this fear has to, has to be obje as objective as it could be. So, for example, I will give you an example of what are the politicians saying. They're not saying we have to do that because I want that. They're saying we have to do that because the credit rating agencies are saying this and this and this. We have to do that because, for example, this research is saying if we don't do that, then the, there will be problems in the fiscal matter. So they are basically externalizing uh, their pol pol policy in a way that the economy is saying we have uh, proof that this should be done in no, no other way, as for example Margaret Thatcher would say there is no alternative. And th this is what now happening, because uh, in Margaret Thatcher's sense, the times that we are living right now are, I would emphasize in this sense, that like, are like turbo, turbo uh, Thatcher in time. Because uh, the politicians are also saying these words in moderate ways, so that people can understand them. You know, we are all in this, but we are not all in this, in the same way. We have to be patient, uh, the GDP will rise after that, but we will wait for a couple of months, couple of years, couple of decades, but nevertheless we will wait, and now we have to cut. All of this is part of strong political propaganda, and if that, if that doesn't work, then there is a last resort, as I was uh, uh, saying, is like divide and rule. So if there is a strong, coherent opposition, just give a candy to one opposition, give a candy to the second opposition, the opposition, it will, it will be like, it will, be, it will break up. If that doesn't work, demonize one part of the opposition against the other, like public sector, or sorry, uh, private sector workers against the public sector workers. That will work better in other cases. So this is all the pattern of the political propaganda, which is a pattern of political engineering, how to implement all these fiscal adjustment strategies. And this is not going on right now, because you know, we are all faced with this situation for 15, 20 years. The regulation of labor market, it's not, you know, uh, uh, it's not happening in, only in the time of crisis. That's why I think it's really important to break up this way of pattern of thinking, working, and that's, uh, that's why I'm saying this, that, uh, for example, this document should be really, really read word by word. What are they doing? They are breaking up, or they are, let's say, taking total control of the state with this type of thinking. And the current phase of this kind of economic, or social, and political engineering is, of course, fiscal compact treaty. So we have to be really strict in a sense of public debts, in a sense of structural adjustment, but okay, in a sense of providing money for the foreign investment, we don't have to be suspect. But in a sense of fiscal compact, there is no room for maneuvers. You know what is now the biggest uh, debate in Slovenia? It's not how to help the workers. It's how to implement as fast as possible fiscal, uh, fiscal compact. And not anywhere, in the constitution. So the fiscal compact is going to be, uh, I hope not, put into the constitution. Can you imagine that, that for example, like a neoliberal doctrine would be legalized in the constitution? And this is like written in this fiscal compact. Up until the 1st March of 2013, uh, the uh, states have to implement the fiscal compact, fiscal rule, the golden rule, into their legislation. If they are not doing that, there will be cut off of financial help if they come in any trouble. If that is not blackmail, I don't know what it is. So this is, this is the, uh, the point when I stop. Uh, maybe just one uh, uh, interesting story. Uh, previously it was said uh, from Costas that uh, consumerism is really one of the ways to, let's say, put a blindfold on the people. Uh, one of the 
uh, let's say, cases which are really interesting right now is, for example, a case of Apple, uh, which is really a horrific story because uh, the Apple components are basically produced in China in the factory which is called uh, Foxconn and uh, the labor costs over there are eight euros, eight dollars and you know all how much iPad costs but nevertheless uh, last week there was a strike of the uh, workers uh, in this plant and the former strike was that 200 workers from the plant uh, went to the rooftop and uh, they, they said that they would commit uh, group suicide and on the other hand I was looking last the same week uh, it was like a YouTube video from uh, one of the activists in Slovenia which was saying that we are against the fiscal rule, we are against the liberalization of uh, mar labor market and so on. So the same story which I could totally agree. But you know, he was holding an Apple iPad in his hand. So that's why I'm saying, okay, maybe some, some, somebody would say I'm a, I'm a bit uh, too picky, but nevertheless you have to know not only what are you talking, but what are you doing. And in, in this sense, I think we have a lot, a lot of uh, gaps to fill uh, in the sense of consumerism. Thank you. Okay, Goran, thank you for this very informative lecture. Uh, I think uh, we are quite behind the schedule, so we have like five minutes left for, uh, for questions or debate. Would you like to come here? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, Gorin. Um, so, um, yeah, thanks for the presentation, Gorin. Um, important that we back up the theory with all the economic trends, etc. Um, however, I do want to um, kind of tackle your one point. So, you referred to the red green government in Germany and its implementation of uh, policies which uh, decreased wage. Uh, levels, um, uh, i.e. increase the rate of intensification of labour. Um, and you said that because it, it was like, well, the comrade was talking about red-green parties, and well, if you look at this example, then red-green parties don't work. My question to you is, was it actually a red-green party? Would you call the Socialist Party in France red? Would you call uh, the SDP in Bosnia red? No, you wouldn't. What you do is actually say that uh, it wasn't a red-green party. Um, you, you, if you want to use the example, maybe the red-green alliance in Denmark as an actual red-green party, then I might listen to you. But I think you're completely wrong on that point, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Well, obviously we have a certain type of <laughs> thinking, but nevertheless we can't hide from the fact that uh, red-green, uh, red -green, let's say, political alliance is there or was there in Germany. That's a fact. So I was saying, I was referring directly to that. For example, I don't really know the landscape of geopolitical Germany as, as uh, let's say, concretely as such, but I cannot run from the fact that there is a political party which calls itself green, and there is a political party which calls itself red, and it's implementing this type of policy. And, it, uh, and that's why I'm saying that. So if some political party is going in a way of, let's say, social democrat, then prove it. That's it. And if they are doing this, I will not be just, you know, said, okay, maybe they are not as green and not as red as they should be. But, you know, this is a problem of also their ideology, how to implement that. But I, will, I, I cannot be just silent because of that. Sorry. So, I mean, it's quite obvious that during the neoliberalization of the economies in the West since the uh, early 80s that a number of SDP, a number of social democratic parties have moved to the right. And I would consider the Red Green Party in Germany to be an example of that. What I'm saying is that, is that, that shouldn't undermine the concept of a Red Green Alliance. That, I, I, just because uh, a number of these social democratic parties have moved to the right and still call themselves social democratic or red or green. No. I mean, I'm under no illusions that the green, green parties in some areas are of the right persuasion. But what I'm saying is that it shouldn't actually undermine the whole concept of forming a red green alliance. On the way of concept, I agree with you, but on the way of political reality, we have a problem. That's why I'm saying this is a problem.
Okay, thank you for this presentation. And um, I just want to, to point out the, the way I kind of uh, um, interpret, interpreted your, your whole presentation. Uh, and since you uh, represent a trade union union of Slovenia, uh, I kind of uh, could not but to, to understand this whole story that you gave us. It was really informative, as the, 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 the girl said. But um, as an as a important and, I would say, um, um, as an important sign of uh, trade unions, like, completely losing their, their power and uh, their, their influence, in a, in a way of negotiating the rules on the labor market with the with the state, would you agree with that? And maybe give a comment on that, please. Well, thank you for that question because uh, unfortunately I have a big problem with that also in the, in, in my sense of defining labor the trade union movement, not only in Slovenia. Uh, I would say that right now the trade unions not only in Slovenia, but throughout the Europe uh, are maybe a bit of losing, uh, let's say, the, the position. This is quite a fact. But nevertheless, uh, we, we, I think we should uh, put the story in more broader perspective, from the micro level to the macro level. What, why I'm saying that? I was saying before the story of this worker, which uh, are, uh, is so afraid that he wouldn't talk. We had several cases, I was just talking to the colleagues before that, in another, another way, the workers were so much angry that with their help we could improve their conditions in their companies. So I think that right now is the time for the trade unions that on the micro level that they go that they are they have to go to the roots. They have to organize new type of workers on a new way. This is why I'm saying now that the labor movement as a such is maybe in a crisis but it has to transform itself in a new way to transform that crisis. Because I don't think that as such, it would, uh, in 10 or 20 years, it would be as important as now. So this is quite a big problem right now for the trade union movement. How do you organize migrant worker? How do you organize flexible worker? If as such, he's flexible, she's flexible. These are the questions on the micro level of questions of organization. On the macro level, I think that we have a big problem also in a way of dealing with the issue of organizing the whole civil society. Uh, because, you know, sometimes it happens that we have a big, let's say, quarrel or a fight, uh, the trade unions against the activists scene. This shouldn't happen, but it happens. You know, the activists, they really believe what they are doing. And they see trade unions as something which is like institutional, which is, let's say, uh, not quite well equipped to do on the ground work, which is more or less has to be more radical. So they are too much politicized. But I will give you one concrete example. Last year, when this social uh, legislation was changed, which is really terrible in now in Slovenia, I was asking the activists to be more, uh, let's say, uh, in to, more, to intervene more concretely in the political sphere, not in the political sphere as politics, so to, to like intervene as political party, but to intervene with their set, for example, also of amendments to the law, with concrete actions in the legislation procedure. And they said, we don't deal with artificial legal language. This is the problem. You know, the activism right now has to go also in the political swamp as much swamp as it is, it has to interfere in that sense. Because on the other hand, it will only shout, and nobody will hear to that. So that's why we have on the macro level also a big issue, how to connect all these groups into the civil societies in one big, massive civil society action. So maybe these two, let's say on micro and macro level actions, has to be taken into account to, let's say, also for me to be more, uh, to, be, to be less, uh, uh, not so optimistic about the trade union movement. I hope I answered your question. I can give you an example. For example, in, in Bosnia, I mean, trade unions are, when looked from the civil society, general civil society activists, civil society uh, position, when looked from their position, 
they're, they're seen more as allies to the state. If we uh, under understand this struggle as people against the state, then the allies of the, of the activists or civil society. So I guess this is a, a, a gap that I have to, have to be filled and crossed in a way. Thank you. Sorry. Can we continue this? Is another debate, but we really, we, really, we really have to stop now. We'll have a five-minute break. Is that okay? And then we'll come back for the today's final lecture by Ed Sam on solutions uh, for the European crisis, I believe. So uh, just a five-minute break, please.